Luke 17, 28 through 33, the King James text today reads, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment for a moment of prayer. Father, we love you God so very much. The Word of God is so powerful. It is today, Lord, indeed sharp. It is today, God, able to pierce even to the dividing asunder of bone and marrow, soul and spirit. Lord, it is not a weapon of destruction, but it is rather today a, a tool that we are able to use for survival. It is a tool, God, that is able to provide food. It is a tool that is able today, Lord, to protect us from the enemy. It is a tool today, God, that is able to perform surgery when surgery is necessary. The man of God, the individual who would stand in the sacred desk, myself today, oh God, we need the anointing, the presence, the power of the Holy Ghost to rest upon us as we preach the Word of God. For there is nothing that I might say or do of myself that can be a blessing, that can be a help or an encouragement to the people of God. I need the anointing, Lord. Lord, touch my mind, touch my body, give me strength. Allow me to speak with divine authority and love that the people of God might not merely hear with their ears, but that rather, O oh God, they might receive upon the tablet of their heart the engrafted word of the Lord, for they will know in their spirit, having received the testimony of the Holy Ghost, that this is in fact today, O oh God, the word of the Lord, and not the opinions or contrivance of men. We ask all this today, O oh God, in another then Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. Let me put it back on my illustration page today. The Word of God tells us that the Old Testament law is but a shadow of things to come. We understand from God's Word that the Old Testament contains types and shadows. That when we look at the stories within the Old Testament, and this is not saying that these stories are not true and factual and historically accurate. I'm not saying that they are not. But what I'm saying is that in the New Testament era, these stories still have an important purpose and an important function for the church today. These stories help to illustrate truths that are imperative for us to understand. The problem is we have many in the church who look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and they think they understand and they know what God's divine purpose was in sharing this particular story with us. 
Most churches that you would go into today, they're going to preach and they're going to tell you that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was given to us to it, uh, exemplify and to demonstrate just how wicked homosexuality is. Boy, you couldn't be further from the truth. You couldn't be more off your rocker uh, if you lost your mind. First of all, you do not understand the story of Sodom and Gomorrah very well. Uh, and secondly, I say this in our church constantly. Anyone who's been part of our church for any length of time knows that I am constantly saying, line upon line. Precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You must keep the Word of God in context. The Word of the Lord tells us in the New Testament, Paul writes to Timothy and said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. So we understand according to God's word that truth is given to us in, in blocks. It's kind of given to us in puzzle pieces. And in order to understand the greater picture, we must pull these pieces together. But they also must fit correctly. Well, in order for them to be fitting correctly, then the Word of God must be rightly divided. Am I telling the truth? You can't just pull this scripture out of here and this scripture over here and try to make it say something. Because, folks, you can just about make the Word of God say anything you want it to say if you do that. Mm -hmm. The Word of God, for instance, in one place, and Judas went and hanged himself. And in another place, the Word of the Lord says, Go and do thou likewise. So I could stand here today and say, hey, the Word of God's telling us everybody needs to go hang himself. No, obviously I'm taking those passages out of context. Right. I've got news for you today. The Word of God tells us exactly why the story of Sodom and thus the story of Lot why that story is included in the canon of the Old Testament. It tells us why that passage exists, why it is there. The problem is we get people who want to pull Genesis 19 out and they want to preach a message without considering what God's Word says about God's Word. I use another phrase frequently. Anyone who has been part of our church, we've been in Dallas now for nearly 19 years. I've been pastoring for way more years than that. And I have always said, Scripture answers Scripture. Right. Anything drives me nuts is when people think they can answer a question that arises from the Word of God by using reasoning. And this is what people do all the time. For instance, in the book of Genesis, the word of God said, the Lord says, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. And immediately theologians going back thousands of years to the Nicene Council, they began to employ human reasoning. Why does God say let us? Oh, well that's easy because that's the Trinity speaking. That speaks of the triune nature of God. No, Scripture answers scripture where in the word of god do you read anywhere that the father and the son and the holy ghost there are three separate people and they're all speaking in chorus to say let us make man in our own image no that is not that's not said anywhere the word of god does tell us a couple of things does tell us first of all that he is king of kings that he is the creator of the world. He is the, the grand potentate, if you would. He is the most high sovereign God. And anyone knows that sovereigns often speak for all of their kingdom. And therefore, they will say, we are not please the queen of england even the queen or the king of various nations when they respond to various things they don't say 
I am not pleased with this or I'm not happy with this. They literally speak for the kingdom because they are the authority. They are the one who speaks. God spoke for all of creation in saying, let us. He's speaking as a sovereign. Secondly, we do know who he was speaking to at creation because the word of God tells us what answers scripture. Scripture answers scripture. The word of God tells us he spoke to the angels and the angels performed his word. Well, it makes perfect sense, seeing as angels are spiritual beings, and God said, let us make man after our own image. God is a spirit. Angels are spiritual beings. So God is saying, let's make man as a spiritual being. Let's make him also spiritual. Amen. So it drives me crazy when people try to answer questions that arise from the Word of God, but they do not do so by going to the Word of God. The story of Lot, as we read it in Genesis chapter 19, is in fact today a type of the church. In our primary text today, Luke chapter 17, we read the Lord speaking and teaching concerning his return, concerning the, ra the rapture of the church, uh, the redemption of God's people. The Lord has just finished prior. Remember what I've said again many, many times over and over again. Keep it in context. Keep it in context. I didn't read the whole thing because I didn't want to stand here for 10 minutes reading the entire chapter. But if you look immediately prior to the text I read today, you'll see that the Lord is using examples to illustrate the coming of the Lord, the timetable surrounding the coming of the Lord. Immediately prior to what we read today, he speaks of the days of Noah. He said, as it was in the days of Noah. They were married and given in marriage, you know. Uh, they did all these things and they, they were just living their lives and they weren't really caring or thinking about anything coming. And then, in our primary text today, look at how it begins. The Lord says, Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot. So he's saying, I've given you one example, which is the example of Noah in the days of Noah. He said, Likewise. So in other words, here is an additional Example here is an additional illustration, but there's a difference in the illustration of Lot and the story of Lot. There's something different about that illustration than there was in the days of Noah. His illustration concerning the days of Noah illustrated how few were saved compared to the number of people that actually lived and existed in Noah's time. His illustration in that particular story had to do with the fact that only eight souls were saved out of all of humanity, out of all those that lived at that time, only eight were saved. But now when he gets to the story of Lot, he's not illustrating that only three came out of Sodom and lived. Because, of course, Lot's wife turned around and turned into a pillar of salt. He's not talking about the number of people in the story of Lot, but listen. He said, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. He said, as it was in the days of Lot, it was a lot like the days of Noah. People lived their lives. They were doing what they did. They didn't really pay any attention. They weren't mindful. No one thought about the possibility of destruction coming. So there's a similarity in conditions between the days of Noah and the days of Lot. But listen, in verse 29 he said, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now listen, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. 
Aha! What is the difference in the illustration of Lot? The difference is the Lord is now speaking of a timetable. He's not talking about how many people were saved. He's talking about a timetable. He said, as soon as righteous Lot and his family exited Sodom, the judgment of God, which is what the fire of, uh, that fell was, began to fall. Am I telling the truth? He said, likewise shall it be. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to get a little Pentecostal today. Likewise, so shall it be at the re revelation, the revealing of the Son of Man. Listen to me, children. When the righteous, when the people of God are removed at the rapture of the church, the Lord is saying, immediately the judgment of God is going to be released in the earth. Hallelujah. But not one minute sooner. The righteous must first be removed. Hallelujah. So the illustration the Lord gives concerning Lot... How many people, how many times have you ever heard this preach? How many times have you ever heard this talk? No, they're too busy talking about homosexuality and the cities were destroyed. No, the Lord is here using the story of Lot specifically as an example, specifically as an illustration. And he is specifically using it to illustrate something very specific, a timetable. We know that the Word of God tells us that at the hour that the great uh, revelation of the Antichrist occurs and he commits the abomination of desolation, the Word of God said he'll go into the restored temple, which does not yet exist in Israel, in Jerusalem, but he will go into the restored temple he will declare himself to be God. Now, elsewhere in the gospel writings, the Lord says that it is this exact moment when this happens, he tells the church, Look up! Because your redemption is at hand. said, the minute this happens, look up! Said, don't turn around and go, same thing he said concerning this story. Same thing he said concerning this illustration. In this illustration, he says, In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. So he says... Just like he says concerning the Antichrist coming into the temple and committing the uh, abomination of desolation. says, at that exact moment, the church is going to be removed. Because at that exact moment, the greatest sin that humanity could ever commit will have been committed. The Antichrist will have declared himself to be God. And at that moment... The tribulation period for the world is going to begin. At that moment, judgment is going to begin upon the world. What must God do in order to rain down fire, so to speak? What must God do before tribulation can begin in the world? What must He do before He unleashes judgment in the world? He must remove Lot. He must take the church out. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So do you see how this story, according to Jesus, has a whole lot greater an import than merely demonstrating, according to so many of my fundamentalist and evangelical friends, uh, how sexual orientation is this great and abominable sin. No, that is not at all the issue. Listen, let's continue to read quickly. He goes on to say, remember Lot's wife? He said, don't, listen. He said, when this happens, don't look back. Don't even think for a second about going back and getting something or doing something because at that moment it's time to leave. You're not even supposed to look back. 
He said, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. The story of Lot today is a type of the rapture of the church. Most preachers and believers lose this important truth as they focus on trying to falsely make the entire story about homosexuality. I have done the research. I know what I'm talking about. Jewish scholars and rabbis will tell you plainly that one homosexuality was not condemned by the uh, law of Moses in wholesale fashion. There was only very specific, a very specific sexual act between men and women were not even mentioned that was condemned within the context of the law. Secondly, the people of Israel were uh, told not to commit a number of sexual acts because they were being led by Moses out of Egypt through the wilderness into the land of Canaan, and it was imperative that they grow as a nation in order to secure their uh, security. It was imperative, you know the old saying, there is security in numbers. It was imperative that they grow numerically in order to establish their security. And therefore God said, don't do a number of things sexually. There are a number of things I don't want you to do because it's imperative that every sexual act potentially result in uh, the birth of a child. Why? Because it was about nation building. Talk to rabbis, talk to scholars in the Jewish community and they will tell you that these two things are true. Thirdly, the primary and most obvious sins of Sodom related to their lack of hospitality, which was a grave sin according to the law of Moses. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 47 through 52, we are told plainly what the sins of Sodom were. We are also told, listen to me children, we are also told by God through the prophet Ezekiel that Israel committed far greater sins than Sodom. That's true. Mm -hmm. I don't remember one time reading anywhere where Israel had become a homosexual society. But in order for their sins to have been greater than Sodom, that would have to have been true. Secondly, in order for their sins to have been greater than Sodom, then their sins would have to be far weightier than homosexuality, if indeed homosexuality were the issue. But according to preachers we hear today, homosexuality is the greatest sin anyone could commit. That's not what the Word of God says. Listen to what the Lord said in Ezekiel 16, 47 through 52. He's speaking to Israel. He said, Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations. Talking about uh, the sins of Sodom and her sister cities. But as if that were a very little thing, thou wast corrupted more than they. In all thy ways. Isn't it funny how these fundamentalists and evangelicals love to claim they believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture. I believe the Bible says what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Till you read something you don't like, then all of a sudden it don't say what it says at all. God here says to Israel, you make the sins of Sodom look like a little thing. Oh, so homosexuality isn't the greatest sin on the planet. If you believe that was the sin of Sodom to begin with, mm -hmm. in a moment we're going to find out that isn't true either, of course. He said, you made the sins of Sodom look small, like it was a very little thing. He continues, 
And he said, and he said, and thou wast corrupted more than they, not in most of your ways, not in many of your ways, but in all thy ways, which would include sexually, so far as I can understand. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, thy sister, hath not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Oh, but then we have theologians that, oh, this is God just using hyperbole. This is God just using, you know, kind of blown up phrases to make a point. Um, do you believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture or don't you? Mm -hmm. How come when it's convenient, all of a sudden God is uh, being hyperbolous? Listen. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. So now God himself, through the prophet Ezekiel, is going to state, he is going to list the specific sins of Sodom. He said, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Listen. Pride. Fullness of bread. And abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. The term abomination here. The term abomination generally refers to sin or offenses that God detests which are directly related to idolatry. Now listen. Said, they also committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. But look at verse 51. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins. But thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thy abominations which thou hast done. What does the Lord say? He says, you literally make Sodom look good by reason of all the abominations that you have done. You've justified your sisters. You've justified them. You know, it's like you got a kid that's bad, but then you see a kid who's way worse than the kid you got, and you turn around and look at your kid and say, good grief, compared to that, my kid looks good. My kid looks like an angel. He may be hyperactive. He may misbehave. He may talk back. But good grief, he's nothing like little cousin so-and-so over there. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is what the Lord is saying through the prophet Ezekiel. He literally says that Israel has justified her sister Sodom and the sister cities of Sodom by reason of its abominations more than they and has justified thy sisters in all thy abominations which thou hast done. Well, apparently if the sins of Sodom were homosexuality, then somewhere in the mix, Israel would have had to have had a reputation for and a penchant for homosexuality. This would have had to have been a major part of their quote-unquote abominations. If in fact, look at Hebrew scholars and they will tell you homosexuality was never a major is issue in Israel. I've done the research. I've looked. A lot of people, you know, they just love to talk like they know what they're talking about, but they've never done the research. I have. But listen to what the Lord says. Thou also, which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame. In that thou hast justified thy sisters. He says, bear your own shame, because you made them look good. 
You know what's funny? If you want to insist that the sins of Sodom were not what God said they were in Ezekiel, through the prophet Ezekiel, if you want to insist that the sins of Sodom were not what God said they were, pridefulness of bread and abundance, abundance of idleness, they did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. If you want to insist that you know better than God what the sins of Sodom were, and that the real sins of Sodom were homosexuality, then I've got news for you today. Ezekiel is telling us in this passage that that issue is small. It is minute compared to the abominations and the sin that Israel later committed. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So this idiotic, foolish, stupid notion that homosexuality is somehow the greatest possible sin is garbage. It is foolishness. It is insanity. The Lord said the sins of Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. She did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination, idolatry, and idolatrous acts before me. Let's look at the story today of Sodom, at least a small portion of it. As we read it in Genesis 19, this is Lot's uh, a portion of Lot's story as it relates to Sodom. In chapter 19, verses 12 through 17, And the men of this, the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? There are two men, two angels, that have come to Lot, and he receives them into their home. He protects them when the people of Sodom come to his door wanting these men to engage with them in a religious sexual orgy. This was common in ancient times, folks. This was not something that was uncommon. Many of your ancient religions that originated in Babylon were very sexual in nature. They wanted to include the angels in their grand orgy. They didn't ask the angels if they wanted to participate. And mind you, they looked at these as men. Anyone who has ever done any research or reading, uh, I've read a number of articles, I've looked at a number of books that talk about uh, angels and visitations, uh, physical visitations from literal angels. Anyone who has ever had a visitation from an angel always describes the angels in two ways. Number, well, three ways. Number one, they always say they are fair-skinned and light-haired. Secondly, they are always tall, very, very tall. Even so much, most people say they're in the neighborhood of eight feet. So they're well beyond the height of a standard man, even a, a basketball player. They're taller than a basketball player. If we had an angel today standing in this room, his head would be touching our ceiling. But they're also described as being beautiful. They're described as appearing male, and they are described as having the most beautiful features. There is something about them as you look at them, whether you're a man or a woman, as you look at them, they just strike you as being the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Therefore, it would make sense in the story of Lot that as these men entered the city, if these angels appeared to Lot and to the people of Sodom at all, as they're described by hundreds of people through the centuries, then it would make sense that the people of Lot, uh, of, uh, excuse me, of Sodom would want to include them in their religious orgy. Because these are gorgeous men. These are incredible specimens. But listen to what the word of the Lord said. The angels say to Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. What? You mean to tell me that 
the decision to destroy was not made after the people of Sodom uh, came to Lot's door wanting the, of course the decision was made prior to this. When you read earlier in chapter 18 and earlier in chapter 19, you read the story and you go back in context, you see that the Lord himself appeared, listen to me, with these two angels before Abraham who was Lot's uncle. And they shared with Abraham their plan. They said, the reputation of Sodom is so great and so wicked and so evil that we've come down to investigate this matter for ourselves because the plan has already been set in motion to destroy it. So the plan was to destroy Sodom Already, that plan was already in motion. Am I telling the truth? But Abraham turns around and he says to the Lord in Genesis 18, verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? So Abraham said, now Lord, wait a minute. Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Are you going to destroy them all together? That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like something that a just God and a righteous God would do. And the Lord said, no, I wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. And that's when Abraham began to barter with God. He said, well, if there be 50 righteous, if there be 30 righteous, and we know the number kept going down. What cracks me up is he knew Lot was there. He knew Lot's wife was there. He knew Lot's two daughters were there and that they had two husbands. So he knew that there were at least six people that were related to him that were in Sodom. And yet he did not barter down to six. I wonder why. Could it be that these people weren't as perfect and as righteous and as holy as we've been made to believe? Could it be that Lot maybe enjoyed living in Sodom at some level? After all, why would you live there if you didn't somehow benefit, if you didn't somehow enjoy life in that city? I lived in New York City for 10 years, but I can tell you uh, I love visiting New York. It's a great city to visit, but I'll tell you, for me personally... I can't stand living there. It is too expensive. It is too loud. It is too uh, uh, obnoxious. I did not like living there almost every day that I was there. It, I grew up in a small town in New England. I grew up where every house had an acre of land and where you had lots of rooms. And, you know, you... Living in New York and the lifestyle in New York never, never, never quite agreed with me. I, I grew accustomed to it at many levels and, you know, I learned to adapt and I, I got along okay in New York City. But it was never my thing. I, uh, when I finally was able to get out of the city, I was happy as a clam because I, I, it was not where I wanted to spend every day of my life till the end of my life. That's not the environment I wanted to live in. But somehow or another, you had to have something there that kept you there. In my case, it had to do with the fact that I had come into a relationship and, you know, and all this. And, and, and so, you know, uh, there has to be a reason that you choose to stay there. Somehow or another, Lot must have gotten something from that experience that he was willing to stay and to live in Sodom. By the way, for homosexual cities, it's awful strange that his daughters both had husbands. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny that these homosexuals, isn't it funny these homosexuals, according to so many great preachers, uh, didn't seem to mind having a heterosexual family living in the midst of them, didn't seem to mind having two heterosexual daughters who had two heterosexual uh, sons-in-law. But the angels tell Lot, they said, The city is slated for destruction. Gather together your family and warn them that you must get out of this city. It is slated to be destroyed. Verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, 
which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. So his sons-in-law were like, You're out of your mind. You're crazy. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and sent him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, the angel that is, Escape from thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So we see that Lot is warned, and Lot believes the angels. Let me tell you a little secret. You remember I said the Word of God says the Old Testament contains types and shadows. It contains stories and illustrations for us. Remember I said that Lot, the story of Lot, Jesus uses the story of Lot to illustrate a timetable concerning the rapture. Oh, there is so much more illustrated in the story of Lot if we really want to go into it. And I won't take a whole lot of time to do it. But I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a couple little things. God made a promise to Abraham that through the seed of Abraham all the nations of the world would be blessed. Isn't it funny that in the story of the destruction of Sodom there are three that appear to Abraham. God himself appears, number one, as a man. This is what's referred to in theological circles as a theophany. This is when God, a deity, appears in human form. It's a theophany. It is a temporary, a temporal manifestation, not a permanent. The Lord himself appears to Abraham as a man. Take a wild guess what he must have looked like. Take a wild guess who he would have looked like. Jesus. Same as the one who appeared in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, in the fiery furnace, we also had a theophany. We also had a temporary physical manifestation of God. But listen, God appears to Abraham with two angels. The Word of God, especially in the book of Revelation, refers to ministers of the gospel as angels. What are angels? Angels are ministers. The Bible said angels are spirits that are sent forth to do what? To minister on behalf of the people of God. So the word of God refers to ministers of the gospel as angels. Now we're not heavenly beings. We're not heavenly. But what we are is we are ministers. We're on a mission just like angels that uh, are in heaven. We are on a mission. We're sent by God to minister on behalf of the people of God and to minister to the people of God. Well now what's interesting, listen, you got, you got to pay close attention to this. Why did God come to Abraham and say, the noise, the sound, the reputation of Sodom is so great that we've come down to look into this matter for ourselves? Um, God is God. He doesn't need to come down to see what's going on. The Bible said he knows the end from the beginning. The Word of God tells us there's nothing that can be hid from Him. Why would God have to manifest Himself physically and come down to earth in order to investigate Sodom? He didn't. He didn't. But He says to Abraham, said, that's why I'm here. I've come to do this. Oh, interesting. Now, when... The men then travel and they leave Abraham's presence. The Word of God tells us now that only two men went into Sodom, not three. Well, wait a minute, Lord. You said you'd come to investigate this matter for yourself. Yet, you no longer are present. You've left, and only the ministers have gone forward. Listen carefully. 
When the Lord sent his disciples out to preach, how did he send them out to preach? In what number? How were they supposed to? They were supposed to go two by two. He sent them out in pairs. Remember I said the Old Testament is types and shadows, it's illustrations. The Lord came to earth. Oh, hallelujah. He came to earth. <laughs> but then when he left, he sent his ministers two by two to go and to do the work. They go to the city. It is there that they're taken in and protected by Lot. And because they see that Lot has a good soul, that Lot is a decent man, he knows what's going to happen in the city at night. He knows these men would not be safe in the streets. He takes these men and they say, you know, this is a man who longs after uh, good. This is a man who desires to do the right thing. You see, the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ will never speak to anyone who has no interest in doing the right thing. Anybody who just wants to live their life and doesn't want anybody telling them how to live and how to do and what they should do and how they should do it, they're not going to be the least bit interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Peter was spoken to by the Lord that there was a man, a Gentile, a Roman soldier sending for him and that he was to go and to preach the gospel of that man, uh, the men who came to Peter to tell him about Cornelius, what did they tell him? They said, he's a good man. He's a righteous man. He does good things. Am I telling the truth? He fears God. You see, he wasn't saved, but he was in a position to be saved because he had a heart that desired to do right. If you and I today did not have a desire in our heart, to do right, we would not be where we are today. We would not know Jesus Christ. We would not understand the gospel. We would not have believed and obeyed because this message only speaks to people who have a desire to do right. Am I telling the truth? Amen. The Word of God calls those people righteous to do right. You do not get into heaven by acts of righteousness. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So righteousness cannot save you. Lot was not merely saved from Sodom because he was righteous. The angels did not go into Sodom to rescue him from the city. That was not why they walked into Sodom at all. Had Lot not approached them, desiring to protect them from what was going to be happening in the city, had Lot not had a desire to do the right thing, had he not acted righteously and reached out to them, they might never have spoken to him, and he and his family might very well have experienced the destruction. But there is a type here. The ministers that Jesus sent two by two, they come into the city. This man reaches out to them. What does the Word of God say? It says, when you go into a city, Jesus said, when you go into a city, he said, stay in whatever home opens its door to you. Isn't that what he said? He said, and if that home is worthy, let your peace come upon it. Isn't that what he said? Lot reaches out to them and he brings them in. They then share with him a warning that destruction is coming. Lot has an option. He can believe it or he can reject it. He believes it. The next morning, these men lead him out and Lot follows. Why? Because he believed. Did his sons-in-law believe? No. They stayed in the city and were destroyed. There is a type here of the gospel going to the unbeliever. There is a type here of the gospel going to that soul in an ungodly world. See, the Bible said that the sins of Sodom uh, vexed 
Lot's righteous soul doesn't mean Lot was perfect and he was blameless and he, you know, he lived in Sodom, but oh, he was just the most godly man that ever walked. That's not at all what it means. But it means that he had a desire to do right. So when the city did things that were not at all right, Lot was vexed by that. It troubled him to see them uh, doing the sorts of things that they did. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So now, he believes, if you might understand the illustration, he believes the gospel. He believes what the angels tell him. He believes what the ministers tell him. And he leaves the city. When he leaves the city, according to Jesus, that is when the judgment came. The people of God must be taken away from the earth. We're warned all the time destruction is coming. We're warned all the time that God's judgment is coming. We're warned all the time, Tommy, those in the JW, that Armageddon is coming, right? But what they're not told in the JW is that God does not judge the righteous with the wicked, that he removes the righteous. He removes those who believe and obey him. Hallelujah. He removes them so that he might then rain down judgment. In our primary text today, the Lord uses Lot as an illustration of timing. The church must first be removed. Lot is a type of the church. And the church must first be removed before the judgment of God can be rained down upon the world. Before the tribulation can begin uh, upon the world. In Matthew 10 verses 11 through 15, the word of the Lord said, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whatsoever, and whosoever, I'm sorry, shall not receive you, listen, nor hear your words. What did Lot do? He received them and he heard their words. He believed them, right? Listen. He said, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust off your feet. Now listen to this. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Oh, hallelujah! So what is a greater sin than the sins that are laid at the feet of Sodom and Gomorrah? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, idolatry. What is a greater sin? Unbelief. Hallelujah! Unbelief. Oh, I'm here to tell you today. Listen to me. The story. Unbelief, I should say, is said to be a greater offense to God than the stated sins of Sodom in Ezekiel today, chapter 16, 47 through 52. This would explain why the emphasis of the gospel is Believe, not behave this way or behave that way. Jesus did not preach behave this way or behave that way. Jesus preached believe. Hallelujah. The message of the Lord Jesus Christ was believe. The promise of the gospel is to them that believe. No works can secure you a place in God's kingdom, but faith in Jesus Christ will. Hallelujah! Do you see how the story of Lot has a whole lot more going for it than a lot of people know? Hallelujah! Oh, again in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 24, the Lord said, Then began he to upbraid the cities, 
wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Shorazan! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. You see, Sodom was never given the option of repentance. No one preached a message of repentance to Sodom. Do you remember when Jonah went to Nineveh? He was told to declare what? Repent? No. He was told to declare destruction. That destruction was coming. But when he went and declared destruction, what happened? The people repented. And God then changed his mind and he didn't destroy them. And Jonah got upset and said, I knew you were going to do that. Sure as I like. You're going to make me go there and preach that you're going to destroy them. And by God, they're going to repent and you're going to turn around and forgive and forget. And, and Jonah was upset by this. But Sodom and Gomorrah were not offered the option of repentance. No. Because the story of Sodom was given to us as an illustration. The illustration being an ungodly world with the church in it. You following me today? The ministers come. They deliver the, the message. The church believes. The church is removed the fire falls. The judgment of God then comes. Oh, I want to tell you, listen. In Matthew, I, I was, Matthew 11 again, verses 20 through 24. He goes on to say in verse 20, uh, uh, 22 that they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 22. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Oh, interesting. Sodom was never offered the option. They were never, God never went in and performed miracles in Sodom. The Lord never sent a message of repentance to Sodom. Why? Because it, the whole story of Sodom is there to illustrate something different. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? He said, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Unbelief is far greater a sin than the sins of Sodom. In Matthew 24, I'm trying to hurry up and close today. Matthew 24, 14 through 21. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in, you, in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Isn't this identical to what the Lord said in Luke 17? Our primary text today, are these not the exact words the Lord used in Luke 17? Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Same identical language he used in our primary text today. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. The church is removed when? At the moment the abomination of desolation occurs. 
and the judgment of God immediately falls. This is exactly what the Lord illustrated in our primary text today. Amen. Luke 17, 28 through 33. This is exactly what he used the story of Lot to illustrate. He said the judgment of God didn't fall until when? Until Lot was removed. Said as soon as Lot was removed, said as soon as Lot, the same day that Lot went out, boom, the fire fell. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Illustrating a time frame. Oh, hallelujah. The story of Lot today is a type of the church. Righteous people living in an unrighteous world. God will remove his people so that he may rain judgment down from heaven upon the unjust. The Lord rewards the godly and punishes the wicked. He is aware of those that do well and will not permit them to be judged with the wicked. Lot heard the warning from the angels and fled the city. His wife, ignoring their warning, looked back, mourning the loss of all she had known, and she became a victim herself of the judgment that day. Lot heard the angel's warning and heeded it. His sons-in-law did not, but laughed at him instead, choosing to stay in Sodom, even after their wives left with their father-in-law, uh, their father. The salvation of Lot and his daughters was based upon their believing the angel's warning. Lot's wife heard, believed, but then turned back, even after the angels had warned them not to do so. Listen, 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, listen to this, above all things, Avoid sexual sin. Oh, no, that's not what he says. Listen. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. What was the sins of Sodom? A great portion of it involved a lack of charity, a lack of hospitality. He said, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity... Love in action is what charity means. Shall cover the multitude of sins. Now listen to this. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. There are people when you say the sins of Sodom had more to do with a lack of hospitality than anything. Oh, I've, I've seen Christian people. <laughs> Oh, they snuff at that. Why, that, that's ridiculous. Hospitality, that's not any great sin. I've got news for you, it is a great sin. Peter says, charity above all things. Have fervent charity. Then he said, use hospitality. One to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So you know what? Charity and hospitality are very important to God. Hebrews 10, 37 through 39. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Listen, children. But if any man draw back. What did Lot's wife do? She looked back. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but to them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hallelujah. Oh, there's a lot about Lot that a lot of folks don't seem to understand, and they don't seem to get. The story of Lot is not the story 
of a man who lived in a homosexual city and who was righteous and perfect and, and he was just disgusted by everything he saw. And, you know, uh, the angels came just to visit, I guess. I guess they were there to visit a club or they were there to, you know, check out the local food fair. I don't know. But according to so many, the destruction of Sodom wasn't set in stone until after the people of the city tried to rape and molest these angelic men. No, you got the story all wrong, man. You got it all wrong. Their sins are listed in Ezekiel, and guess what? The term abomination doesn't even appear until the last item on the list. And Ezekiel was a prophet. He was not speaking for himself. He was literally speaking in the name of the Lord or on behalf of the Lord. God does not say anything accidentally. God does not accidentally put things in, a, in an order. I guarantee you when God puts things in a specific sequence, it is because that sequence is according to importance. Hello now. And their abomination, their idolatry, the sexual conduct that they engaged in was part of their idolatry. That didn't even appear on the list, Tommy, until the end. First they started with pride and fullness of bread and abundance of idleness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, haughty. Uh, they didn't care for the poor and the needy. They didn't care for those people. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, the sins of America are right in line with the sins of Sodom. America is today the modern Sodom. Absolutely. Oh, there's wealth all over the place. There's an abundance of bread. People here, we eat in this country like nobody eats anywhere. You can't go to a restaurant if they don't give you a plate of food piled a mile high. You feel like you've been robbed. And yet, you can go to Europe and they'll serve you a dinner. And you look at the plate and think, my God, these people are trying to charge me 30 francs for this. What are they out of their mind? There ain't enough food on this plate to feed it. Because we're so used to abundance of bread. Am I telling the truth? Got people in this country who are able to spend more time playing golf, riding their boats and water skiing and snow skiing than working. And yet in other countries, if people are going to just survive, they've got to work almost from sun up till sundown, and all they have time to do is sleep. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Oh, children, I want you to understand this hour. If you understand nothing, I want you to understand today the story of Lot is a type of the church. Hallelujah. If you look at the story of Sodom and look at the story of Lot, understanding it is a type of the church, you will see all the wonderful parallels. I didn't want to go into it today because I don't have time. But the parallels are all that. It's, it's amazing, the parallels. Absolutely wonderful. Take the time to look at the story again and you'll see the parallels. There's a lot about Lot or a lot more to Lot than a lot of people know. Hallelujah. Which is next?